Okay, well, good morning, everybody. I uh, have a very special treat for you today. Uh, my guest today is, uh, I, I thought about how I might introduce him, and this was one of the most difficult things of all the things I thought about. Um, it's very hard to give an introduction to this man. He considers himself a physicist, I think, but he's had an enormous footprint on many different disciplines, including sports medicine, biomechanics, and of course, athletic footwear and I've had the rare privilege of being able to work with him over the last five years and and uh, also to uh, to uh, call him my friend which is uh, in my professional career is uh, a real highlight I must say I am of course talking to Professor Ben O'Nig he is in Calgary he tells me it's a beautiful day there but quite cold welcome Benno thank you very much for joining us this morning this afternoon your time thank you now, Ben, I, I, one of the things that intrigues me, we we have all sorts of uh, things swirling around us in relation to the new footwear that we've seen, um, in particular some of the carbon-plated uh, footwear, but especially the product from Nike, which we'll talk about in a moment. And I remember way, way back, 21 years ago, in fact, in Brisbane at the uh, IOC Pre-Olympic Conference, you and I had a bit of a chat, and you told me that you were working on footwear with a carbon fibre plate for the Olympic Games, which was going to make athletes run faster. And this is intriguing me now, because of all the people who are talking about this, I don't hear a lot of input from the man who's probably had more to do with it than anybody, and that is you. So I wonder if you could take us back and just tell us a little bit about your experiences with what you were doing all those years ago, and I know there has been a succession through various researches right up to, to where we are today. So could you just tell us a little bit about what you did all those years ago with uh, Adidas, I believe, <clears throat> in developing shoes with carbon fiber plates? Uh, what we did, we, I had a PhD student at that time, Darren Stefanishin, who is a sport shoe researcher now in his own right. And he worked on a thesis to understand the effect of stiffening the sole in the longitudinal direction on performance. The idea was that what you can do, you can lengthen the lever that you have between the ankle joint and the point of application of the force during takeoff. And if you do that, you should have a better performance if you are strong enough to apply that with your muscles. That was the idea, and the idea had a second thing, and that was the, the idea of not allowing the <clears throat> the tarsal phalangeal joint to bend because when you look at sprinters they bend them at the metatarsal phalangeal joint and by doing that they lose energy whenever you bend the joint you lose energy and they don't get it back you know if you bend for instance the knee joint then you stretch it again and then you get the energy back and you don't have that in the metatarsal joint. And the result that we have at that time was in the average with top sprinters below uh, 11 seconds in 100 meters. was uh, an average of about 1.5% improvement of performance. So this is total speed we're talking about here. So <clears throat> the measurement in performance was, was speed. Yep. The problem with that idea was that it didn't allow them to bend the metatarsal phalangeal joint, which means that they couldn't start well with these shoes. Mm. But other than that, when once you were running, the, 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 the effect was there. Mm. And when you look at the shoes, the running shoes, the boost shoes that Adidas built, they had already plates in there. Right. So they produced a kind of a, an improvement at that time. Right. 
So if I recall correctly, when um, when this was published, I think there was um, there was an inverse relationship between um, between plate stiffening and um, and speed. So in other words, there, there was a point at which the plate became too stiff and it decreased performance. Is that no. correct? No, no, it was no. Okay, I don't know where I got that from. Every athlete had a different optimum. Okay. So <clears throat> I'm very interested that you said that um, in order to exploit these shoes correctly, the athlete had to be strong enough. So this is interesting. We, we can perhaps fold this into the current day um, and talk about what we saw in Vienna with uh, Elliot Kipchoge. So I think the, the discussion has been, it's almost become a polarised discussion where one group believe it was just the shoe and the other group believe it was just the athlete. And of course, neither is correct. But um, how important is it, do you think, or how, how much would that shoe have been tuned to the specific requirements of Kipchoge, do you believe? I don't know that, but I would expect it was not specially tuned. Really? Interesting. I mean, okay. you know, the... the, the <clears throat> that they had with the, the studies with Roger Cram was that they had in the average about 4% increase of performance or oxygen consumption was changed by 4%, which is kind of proportional to the performance. Yeah. And uh, that study has been repeated by different other groups and they got about the same results. So it is the 4% are there from the shoe. The question is rather why didn't he improve the performance four percent? Yeah. Now one of the interesting questions here is that you you and I have been talking over the last few years about fatigue and, and vibration in particular. And one of the things that intrigues me about this is just uh, when Kipchoge crossed the finish line in Vienna, he really did look like he could go and run another marathon. He looked very fresh, and he didn't—he didn't look like a, a guy who'd just gone, been the first man to go under two hours. And it got me thinking about whether there might have been, uh, either either on purpose or inadvertently, there might have been some effect of this shoe in in dampening vibration to some point, and that may well have had an effect on on his fatigue. Have you got any thoughts on that at all? I mean, you know the the shoe that they built is a shoe that has a very soft sole. So that means that you basically reduce the frequency of the input signal. And typically reducing the frequency of the input signal means that you get a little bit away from the resonance frequency of that system. So it could well be that this is the case. I never yeah. have measured it and that I'm not sure whether they have measured, but uh, uh, it could be that this is uh, just uh, a lucky coincidence. Yeah, it does. It does seem quite quite interesting that the athletes appear. Uh, you know, even Bridget uh, Kopke also appeared very fresh when she finished the line. Um, yeah, one of the interesting things about that shoe, also, I think, is the is the geometry. So there's been a lot of discussion about the plate, and there's been a lot of discussion about the PVAX foam and its thickness, but. Also, I think the way the Alpha Fly has been constructed is very interesting in terms of its geometry and and the way it is. It, it seems to be a, a combination of many moving parts, for want of a better word. And that's, I guess, what got me thinking about whether there there was the possibility that there was some uh, dampening of of vibration. So I'm interested in your thoughts on that. It's so, possible, but nobody showed. No, no, no. I, I don't think anybody's actually actually researched it. So there you go. There's a great project for you, Ben. You can uh, you can do that in your spare time. <laughs> As a matter of fact, we do it. Oh, is that right? <laughs> well, we that topic. Why didn't you invite me to look at this? I'm very interested. Oh, boy. Well, that's I I, I, will, I will very much look forward to hearing about that for sure. Um, yeah. So I think what I would like to, your opinion on also is. Um, there, there has been a lot of discussion, so I'll put you on the spot here a little bit and say there, there's been a lot of discussion and a lot of chatter about the, uh, you know, the, the shoes really from the 4% through the next percent and the alpha fly about the shoes being a cheat shoe, you know, people are calling them EPO for the feet. I have my own thoughts on that, um, but some people are quite vocal and quite definite that this shoe should have been outlawed. Um, what are your 
thoughts on the way this has been handled and and your personal thoughts on 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 this technology in in, in 2020 and, and and the legality of it all or the fairness of it all i mean the legality is they are within the legality i mean there are no rules that don't allow you to build a shoe like that or to use a shoe like that so what has been done up till now were a few discussions, but nothing serious. And uh, I think it is up to the, the Federation to make decision. I remember in uh, 1981, when in rowing, you know, in rowing, the seats move back and forward. And that is very negative from a performance point of view. So the uh, German rower, I think his name was Krabbe. He built a boat where the seat was fixed and the outriggers were moving. That is much, much less mass and that influences the change in velocity much more. And the change in velocity is, is, is influencing the performance to the power three. Wow. So it's very, very high. And the rowing federation didn't wait more than one or two competitions and sit together and then made a limit and said that cannot be done. Hmm. Or in swimming, the the swimsuits, that was another thing. So <coughs> up to the Federation to make a decision. Yeah. And you can argue in both directions. You can argue, you know, everybody has to be able to buy it. And if that is the case, then everybody is the same. Mm -hmm. Or you can argue, you know, we don't want, we want something that is as close as possible to barefoot running. And uh, we only allow shoes that do that. I mean, <coughs> you, you can argue for both, both sides. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's very interesting, isn't it, that I think um, that the, the super elite athletes, those, those who are likely to do very well in Olympic Games in the marathon or, or win a major, from my experience working with with major companies, um, it's I think it's very unlikely that that the shoes those those athletes wear w would be anything other than a prototype. I don't think they they would really ever be commercially available. And I'm sure we'll never we'll never know or see a commercially available shoe a shoe of the type Kipchoge wore in Vienna. So the whole concept that you that you would bring a shoe out that would be available to the masses being the same these guys wear. I'm not sure that really flies, Ben. I'm not sure that we're, we're ever really going to know what, what goes on behind closed doors there. I think the rule right now is that a product has to be available at a certain time. The track and field rules. Yep. But how, would that, be, how would that be policed? I mean, if, if, if somebody wanted to, if Addy or Nike wanted to build a prototype and put their athlete in that shoe and it it had a few tweaks and a bit of magic dust sprinkled on it for the Olympic Games or or the Boston Marathon. How how can World Athletics test that? It's not like it's not like being able to test um, for drugs or or blood or blood doping. Um, I, I just don't know how that's going to be enforced. I don't know, but the rule exists. The rule exists. Yep, and 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 it's very important for anybody listening to this that, that under the current uh, recommendation or the current new regulation from World Athletics. We should be quite clear that that all of the current Nike product, including the Alpha Flyer, which is due for release this month, are legal according to the new ruling. So uh, that that side of the argument uh, has been has been knocked on the head. So that takes us very naturally into the future, I guess. And what people may not understand is that when you work in athletic future, you you are kind of working in the future because you, you're typically working on projects that are due to be completed several years ahead so i'm quite sure that that nike who obviously have an incredible research facility and, and capability are working on product that's way more sophisticated than we're seeing right now in 2020. the question i have for you benno is what wh where is this all going to end do you think i i mean it's it's quite interesting that we're being told this is an arms race and we're seeing product coming out from several other different companies but at what point do people like you and i you and i who are interested in the technology and who are embedded in um, athletic footwear, at what point do we say enough is enough? I don't think we say that. 
<laughs> I was hoping I would say that. No, I, I mean, I, I think it's fun to see what you can do. As a matter of fact, I'm not sure how much the Nike people understand their concept. You know, it it can can be that they understand it fully, or it can understand that they have a few things that they got just as a freebie with, with, with the development. Uh, I think it may be the second one. I'm not sure, but I mean, we try to work on that question too. We have people here working on improving performance of a running shoe or improving performance of a basketball shoe. We, we do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's fun to do that. And we try to do that within the rules that the federations give us. Yeah, that's very interesting because I, I'd sort of pondered that question myself and wondered whether they just sort of stumbled along something that uh, it's sort of a perfect storm where things came together and, and we had a performance advantage. And the other interesting thing is, I, I know you published a little while ago um, on basketball shoes and looking at, uh, if, I, if I'm correct, I think it was jump height, and you had, uh, you had two different shoes, we had two shoes, and you were able to show that one group were consistently jumping higher in that shoe, but in fact the two shoes were identical, and you had actually told one group that the, the one shoe would make them jump higher. Did it, is that correct? You, you, you did that experiment? Something like that, yeah. Yeah. So, so that obviously we is... Did, uh, but you told the athlete, but we told the athletes affected the result dramatically. And the difference in mass that he had was 600 grams. Wow. Wow. That's huge. Yeah. Huge. So, the bit, so the big question here is if, uh, you know, if, we, if we're going to tell an athlete that they're going to be 4% more efficient in, in a shoe, um, and, and they know that and told that, how much does the placebo effect come into play here? Yeah, you know, I mean, as far as I know, all the studies that have been done with these 4%, they did not control for the placebo effect. So it could be that in all cases, placebo played a role. And, you know, I told you before, why is it not that he run 4% faster? I mean, the, the improvement was about uh, one and a half minutes or something like that, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right, yep. And uh, the, the time was about 120 minutes. So 4% of 120 minutes would be five minutes. Why didn't they improve by five minutes? Why did they only improve by one and a half minutes? That suggests to me that <coughs> that the, the placebo effect played a big role. Yeah, so I think it... Sorry? They have not addressed that, that point in the studies. At least I have not seen it. Yeah. Yeah, I know I spoke to... Um, maybe it was Emily Farina in Kananaskis. I can't remember who it was. And and I, I actually asked that question, how come, you didn't, how come you didn't blind the shoes? And she said, well, we didn't do that because there was... It was so obvious what shoe they were wearing that they couldn't they couldn't physically um, uh, blind the athlete to the shoe because they felt very different, which is a fair point. But from a research perspective, it's problematic because we just don't know what that what that effect is. And, and I suspect it might be quite significant, especially in in people who are wanting to maybe they're on the cusp of running a, a sub three hour marathon and they're not quite there. And, you know, this might actually be the impetus just to get them over the line to go under three hours. So we, we don't know. But if you look at if you look at the results that uh, these women had lately, it's unbelievable, the improvement. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I mean, the product does something. Yeah, oh, for sure. Yeah, I think, I think Bridget, Bridget Cosguy's effort was, uh, you know, she, she destroyed Paula Radcliffe's world record. I mean, it wasn't just by a bit. It was a massive margin. So we're seeing big changes. And we're seeing, you know, historically, the changes over many years have only been quite incremental. We're now seeing massive changes, so I think it's pretty obvious that the shoe is doing something quite, uh, quite important. And it's not everything is possible. There yeah. are some real things in there. Yeah, for sure. So, <clears throat> where is it? Where is it going to take us, Ben? I mean, there's no one better place to uh, to give an opinion on that. We, uh, you know, we're seeing uh, a lot of people talk about 
the new shoes as, as having springs in them. And I've seen some quite high profile people talk about this. That's, of course, not really understanding the way a carbon fiber plate works because it's not a spring at all. It's a, it's it's more of a lever if it's anything. But um, where, where do you think where do you think the focus will be? I know you and I have talked about construction techniques and geometry. We have talked about not just different foams and materials, but how you how you potentially could um, combine or layer those foams and how you could manipulate geometry. Uh, those I think are some of the some of the things that have not yet been perfected. But but what's your what's your thought on where this might all go? Yeah, I, I know. I, I I don't think that the major thing is the material. It's a little bit. Uh, yeah. it, 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 it basically s softens the landing and it changes the input frequency so that the peak loading is a little bit later. But that is not that you can use that deformation as returned energy because it's too early. Yeah. It's still too early, so it, it, that, that's not that's not the situation. Right. Okay. So I don't think that the major factor is the material. Even so, you know, Adidas made something with material with boost, and they made a bit of, uh, a little bit an improvement, and you can explain that with the material, and then a little bit of the improvement of the Nike issue may be due to the material too, but that's not 4%. It's much, much less. Yeah. <clears throat> so one of the things I'm interested in is, again, over the, over the last few years, we've talked a lot about viscosity of materials, and, and we now have manufacturing capabilities with um, inline DES ma machines to, to bleed PU, so to, uh, to have... Um, variable viscosity within one PU midsole. Do you see there's some real potential in that in terms of, um, we could probably take take the focus away from running now and talk about maybe court sports and and how within a game, say like basketball, you actually will have players who are the biomechanics of the game, they're playing quite different. So if you, the center the centre player is playing a different game to uh, to one of the power forwards really. Do you think we're going to see a, an era where we will be able to really customize footwear and, and change viscosity in midsoles depending on position of players? Yes, that's possible. But, you know, the major problem of viscosity is not where you put it. The major problem is that we don't know what it does. <laughs> the only thing that we know is in, in all our studies, whenever we had a viscous heel, we had an improvement of performance and or an improvement of comfort. That's the only thing that we know. Why we have that, we don't know. Mm -hmm. So we also know that viscous materials in the forefoot always had negative effects on performance and on comfort. Mm -hmm. So we know that when we use viscous material, we use them in the heel of the foot. Mm. Okay. It does exactly, we don't know. Okay. So my, <clears throat> my next and potentially final question is, um, you know, we talked a little bit about where it's all going and the focus at the moment is on materials and plates, but I'm quite interested to know where it might go. So this is something that I, I printed up quite recently at, at Monash University, and this is, as you can see, uh, this is a, a 3D printed um, lattice that can be dropped into a, a midsole, either EVA or PU or any material really. So in effect, it's 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 acting. I suppose the shoe then actually becomes more like an orthotic device, and that that capability, that manufacturing capability, is is available right now. So it's a it's a it's a different spin on what's happening with the plates etc now do you think we are going to see it go that way or and, and and also again the question about legality where where do we draw the line and all of that that what goes in which way the sole construction 
Yeah. So if we if we were if we were to take something like this PU lattice and we were to uh, gather the biometric data from from the particular athlete and and build in essence what was a 3D printed uh, lattice orthotic, embed it in either PU or EVA, and that that was their shoe. So that. That is a, an interesting concept that I think, uh, you know, from a manufacturing perspective, we can do that right now. But how do you think that's a, is that a viable, um, is that a viable way to be thinking about the future? Oh, yeah, certainly. I mean, you know, if you build a bridge, you don't fill the bridge with all with material. You have those at the locations where you have high stresses and high forces you have material, and that's the same thing here. So, I mean, as a matter of fact, I have seen shoes that are made like that, but the, the whole sole is made like that. Yep, yep. And yeah. uh, that kind of makes sense. Yeah, it, yeah, I think it does for me, and I think it fits into what we know a little bit about, about futurism. And and the other, the other question, I guess, would be about the importance of the last and... We again, our manufacturing capability has changed a bit in the last few years, so we no longer have to rely on a completely flat-bottomed last. And so, do you believe that that the last is still still has the potential to change performance, or is it really only something that defines fit and comfort? Yeah, you know, I I mean, with the three D printing, people think that you can make a a shoe that is really subject specific and uh, does, does all the things best for the subject. What the 3D printing can do, you can basically replace the last with the real foot. That it can easily do, you know, you, it, that is already done, uh, that's not a problem. What the 3D printing cannot do at the moment and for quite a, some time is to give an input in that the function of the person is reflected. Mm. You know, for instance, I, one person lands a little bit harder, the other person a little bit softer. One person has a little bit uh, uh, e version of the photo, whatever these things are. If we want to have the movement of a person simulated and then replicated in the shoe, as an input into the 3D printer, we don't have that, and we will not have that for quite a while. So I think the future of the 3D printing, in my view, the near future, is primarily to replace the last. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, I agree, and I think I think probably what we will see if we if if the process is too expensive for bespoke last making or you know very specific to an athlete. I suspect we'll probably see the companies are developing libraries of last. So, you know, clearly now most companies with running at least are only working off one, maybe two lasts. But we may well see um, a time in the future where companies are working with 100 lasts or 50 lasts and and we can we can get a much more accurate uh, fit based on, on that library. Is that something that you think is, is probably a... Um, not not necessarily a likelihood, but do you, can you see that that being something that might happen? No, that that could be possible. I I think rather I I don't think that I would go that way. I would go the way that I measure the the shape of the foot of a person, which can be done easily with these different yep. measuring devices that are already on the market. Input that into a three D printing unit and then have the actual foot. Shape. Yep. Yep. I completely agree. I think that's that's a, a you know why, why mess around? But uh, <clears throat> I guess the only the only defining factor of all of that m may be the cost. But I mean the costs are coming down very very rapidly, and it's not that expensive to three D print a last at all. And that's something you always have. Well, Ben, I, I have uh, as always really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you very much for giving up your valuable time today. Um, there's some really interesting stuff there. Um, is there any one last pearl you want to leave us with in terms of um, you've been in this industry for a long time and you've seen many changes over many years? Where do you feel we are in, in 2020 in um, in running footwear? Is this uh, is this right up there with the most vibrant and challenging times we've seen in running footwear, do you think? 
I think it's exciting. And uh, but what I what I also think is that you know I never have seen a person that could explain to me what the Nike shoe really does. And I don't know whether there is a person that knows what's going on. And if we don't understand what's going on, I think that limits our development. And we should try to understand what's going on, which I try to do, and uh, I think I'm relatively close. And then we can improve it even further. Yeah, well, that is. I to understand, but it is not just make some general statement. Oh, it's uh, better cushioning and whatever, and but functionally being able to explain what it really is. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting point because historically, um, in footwear, in in the footwear industry, we've had shoes that have come out and they're quite unidimensional in terms of their claims and and uh, and what they what they what they do, what they put into the shoe. And I'm I'm quite sure you're right that they don't necessarily understand the consequences or or the way that that is working. So all I can say is personally, I'm very much looking forward to seeing what you come up with in terms of explaining that to us all. I look forward to it. Well, Ben, I thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. I hope that I can see you in uh, in the flesh at some time this year. I'm not sure what your movements are, but we we do cross paths fairly regularly. So hopefully we'll catch up. Um, and maybe are you going to Monaco this year for the, the sports medicine no, conference? No, no Monaco. Okay. All right. Well, we'll leave it there. Thanks again very much for your time. And I uh, hope people have Such enjoyed this. Like Thank always. you, Benno. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. We'll, we'll speak to you soon.